first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Uh, very nice to see you all. So today I'm going to talk about ageing, a topic with which we are all familiar, so I don't have to introduce it to you. We hear about ageing all the time, in the context of population changes and increases in the number of older people. This topic is typically discussed in terms of limited resources, problems for care in old age, pensions, problems with pensions. Most, of, but not all, of what we hear gives the distinct impression that ageing is something to mourn, to complain about, and to be concerned about, at both personal and social levels. What we rarely hear about are the benefits to society of an ageing population. And this is because the common stereotype of ageing is one of decline, both physical and mental. Now, if people actually did inevitably fall apart as they age, then this view may be understandable, but in fact they don't. The current stereotypes of ageing are not keeping pace with the science, which shows that there is everything to play for, that ageing is not an inevitable process of inexorable decline, physically or mentally, and that there are steps that we as individuals can, ma can take to maximise our physical and mental well-being. And it's this research that I'll be talking about today. I'll be putting together some of the evidence for, the, for this more optimistic approach to ageing. Okay, so to warm up, you're supposed to warm up your audience. So to warm up um, my audience, I'm going to start with a bit of light comic relief. You'll be grateful for this as I go through it. Okay, we've all, anybody over 20 has experienced this. It might get uh, more frequent as we get older, but certainly we all have the experience, I'm sure, or have, have had the experience of not being able to quite find the right word sometimes at the right time. It's called a senior moment, but of course we all know younger people who have the same experience. And I thought I'd include this as um, certainly it's very typical of my husband, not in particular about the car, but uh, certainly going somewhere uh, to do something and then not remembering what he was uh, about to do. And I'm sure we've all had this experience as well. Okay, so to turn to the serious side of ageing then, I'm going to, this is the structure of uh, the talk, I'm going to discuss variability in cognitive and brain changes across the lifespan, and variability across individuals, cognitive functions and brain regions. I'm going to argue that brain health, rather than chronological age, is the key to preserve cognition, and I'm going to show that the brain is flexible and adaptive. And I'm then going to ask whether we can enhance the adaptive properties of the brain and preserve cognitive health. So turning then to the serious side, I'm going to first of all talk about the changes that occur that are typical in um, ageing. So first of all, what we see is variation in age-related cognitive declines. Now you wouldn't think this if you read the literature, or if you read the popular press, you'd think that ageing was associated with a decline across all cognitive faculties and that we were just getting more and more useless as we got older. But in fact, even this picture, this crude picture, is not very accurate because there's enormous amount of variation in the cognitive faculties that do go, typically, as we age, eventually. Okay, so for example, fluid intelligence... Well, fluid intelligence is the ability to reason abstractly about complex information that doesn't depend on what you know. It doesn't depend upon a store of knowledge, just being more knowledgeable or well-read than someone else. And you can see that this shows a decline across the adult lifespan. Similarly with spatial attention, when we're trying to, for example, figure out whether two objects are the same when they're in different orientation, that also shows a decline. Processing speed, well, we do get a bit slower as we get older, but it's not massive. Um, and it's not all downhill, though, because there are some things that hardly change at all across the lifespan. So, for example, we can still do calculation, we can still do mathematical operations without any trouble. Also, verbal ability continues to be good and even improves from the early years. Okay, so not everything goes. 
the hallmark of these changes, of cognitive changes across the adult lifespan then, is variability. There isn't a single pattern that characterizes these changes that take place. Now I'm going to point to another kind of variability, which is hugely important, and that's individual variability. So rather than everyone of a particular age, or more or less everyone of a particular age, showing the same pattern of declines, there's huge variability across the lifespan, not just as you get old. So this graph then is going to show you changes or the variability in, cha in cognitive changes with age. And this is age along the x-axis along here. So this is, a, this is um, data from our own lab that Meredith Shafto put together. So this is, uh, we, we, had 100, we have 196 uh, people who are in our pool aged 18 to 89 years. So you can see with fluid intelligence then, which is the ability to abstractly re reason, that there's an, all of these dots are individual data points. And you can see that there's huge amount of variability across the age range. So some of these people who are in their 80s look like young people. And some of these people who are in their 80s right, look worse than young people. But then there's a whole range of performance also amongst the young. So this variability is not just true of older people, it's true across the age range. And we see this across a variety of, well, every cognitive function that you look at, you see this huge variability. Working memory, vocabulary, and sentence comprehension. So even, even cognitive functions which typically either decline or don't decline, you see a lot of individual variability. Now, the brain changes with age, so moving from cognition to brain function, and the brain shows the same kinds of variability as we see in cognition. So it is not the case that as one reaches a particular kind of age, you could even accurately look at, the, look at a scan of their brain and decide, decide how old they are. There's so much variability. But these changes that take place with age are quite extensive. One can't deny that they're taking place. The thing is that what I'm going to argue is that um, brain changes per se aren't, aren't necessarily as worrying and upsetting as we think that they might be. So before I start talking about the brain, I'm assuming that most of you don't sit staring at brains all day, like we do. Um, so that you might want to just a little bit of um, orientation. So for that reason, I've put up this brain here, a picture of a brain, just to orient you with respect to the sort of major structures. So here we have the frontal lobe, and I'm going to be talking a lot about that. Here we have the parietal lobe. This is involved in um, attention, for example, other faculties as well. Occipital lobe involved in vision and the uh, temporal cortex, which is involved in, in memory. The frontal cortex is, involved in, is thought to be involved in a huge number of functions, high-level cognitive functions. I'm also showing you a bit of the, another bit of the brain that's going to be really important, which is the hippocampus. So <coughs> inside here, tucked inside here, you can see, because this is cut away, I didn't do it personally, um, is the hippocampus. And this is a region of the brain that's involved in learning and memory, and that is also going to be a region that I talk about here today. Okay, just to also tell you about some of the major divisions in the brain, so we have grain, so here, this is a picture here of a slice taken through the head here. And what it depicts is the gray matter, that's this darker stuff around the outside, these are the neurons, or the cells, right, that form brain. And then the white matter are these paler areas. These are the connecting tracts between connections, between concentra sorry, concentrations of neurons. I'm mostly going to fo focus on gray matter, but you need to know that brain function, or cognitive function, is comprised of all of this different kind of tissue. Oh, so, okay, so age-related changes in brain structure, this is going to give you an example of the changes that take place across the adult lifespan. But before you get sort of freaked out, just remember this huge variability in the changes that take place. 
Okay, here we go. 27, 30, 34, 49, 55, 58. <laughs> 60, and on we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and just to bring it into really stark relief. <laughs> so here we've got 20 year old and here we've got an 86 year old. Now what you can notice is this shrinkage. So the gray matter, remember, it was around the outside of the brain. It sh shrunk in an older brain compared to a younger brain, and you get these hugely enlarged <coughs> ventricles. But it's what you can do with your brain that counts, not how much you have of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows the typical aging profile, um, just to give you a picture of the kinds of changes that are taking place overall across the lifespan. <coughs> So as I was saying, just as there are, there's a lot of variability in cognitive changes, there's also lots of variability in changes in gray matter with age. So first of all, if you look at this picture, what this depicts is changes in gray matter in, in those neurons, right, in different regions of the brain over time. And you can see in this blow up a bit more clearly what's happening. So we have a mound of gray matter here, an increasing age here. And you can see that in, in this part of the brain, this was a, a bit in the frontal cortex, you get a rapid drop off in the amount of gray matter as people age. But in this more posterior region of the brain, there's hardly any drop off with age. So different regions of the brain then are showing different rates of cellular drop off, if you like. There's also a lot of individual variability all the way across the brain, as you could maybe see uh, um, in the other slide, but I'll show you again here. So here you see older, the amount of uh, gray matter loss in older, pe in, uh, in older people versus younger people. There's lots of overlap. So again, we see the same kinds of variability. And we also, you'll get sick of hearing the word variability, I'm afraid. It's, the, it's, the, uh, it's my signature word um, in this talk. So there's also an enormous amount of variability in changes in white matter tracts. So there's huge variability, as you can see, at all ages. And another important point to remember, if you're sitting there feeling, well, I'm only 20 or 30, and so it's OK for me, <coughs> is that it's all starting to fall apart around here. <laughs> So white matter tracts then start to decline as early as about 30. And so this makes the point that aging is not something that happens to us late in life. It's a maturational process that occurs from early adulthood. There are changes that are taking place in our brain all through our lives. Um, and aging is almost becoming the wrong word to use um, in the sense in which it's used to depict l loss because, in fact, there are various losses and changes that are taking place throughout adulthood. Okay, just to summarize this section, then, there's variability, huge variability, then, across individuals in both cognitive, and brain, in cognitive functions and brain regions, and change is, a conti is continuous across the adult lifespan. So changes, then, associated with aging are not discrete, they don't occur at a specific time in our lives. Change is continuous. Okay, I'm now going to talk about um, the relationship between brain changes and cognitive changes. This is the key thing, the relationship between them. I mean, if changes in the brain had no um, effect on cognition, then who would mind? But, of course, it does. Okay, so the dominant, the prevailing view then in the literature is that aging is associated with an inevitable decline in both performance and brain measures. So you have age marching on here and declines in brain and declines in cognitive performance. But actually, there's an, a recent emerging view in which brain changes rather than... Um, chronological age accounts for cognitive changes. 
So the idea here is that once you account... So obviously there is a close relationship between age and brain changes, but it doesn't account completely for the changes that take place in your brain. And if you partial out age, if you take away the effect of age and you just look at the effect of brain, that's a much stronger predictor of your cognitive success. Okay. <coughs> and this is, um, you know, this actually, as we'll see, seems to me to be a very hopeful sign. I love this uh, striking example of this idea. This is... Um, 115-year-old woman, or she was, because we've now got slices of her brain. So this is a woman who, two years before her death, her cognitive performance was above average for healthy adults of 60 to 75. And a post-mortem analysis revealed almost no pathology in her brain. So this is what her brain looked like, a slice through her brain. This is the, the brain of a 30-year-old. And this is the brain of an Alzheimer patient. So she looked, as you can see, I mean, in many ways the tissue looks very similar to a 30-year-old. So this lovely example, I think, makes it clear that when the brain is healthy, whatever the age, cognitive deficits are less pronounced. Okay, so this is a preamble then um, to make the point that one can take a different angle on aging, in which age-related changes in brain and, con and cognition are not uniform, they're not inevitable, and they're not immutable, which is perhaps the most important thing. Okay, so the old, if we like, view on aging is that everything goes, so you might as well slide into an active old age. My own view, and those of many of my colleagues now, is that this is not right. This is the wrong model. Age matters, right? Chronological age matters. But brain health matters much more. And that, moreover, we know that the brain remains flexible and adaptive across the lifespan, and that this flexibility helps to preserve cognitive function. And we can see this flexibility in lots of different ways. So one way is the way in which the, um, the functional activation, the way in which our brains, when they're carrying out different kinds of cognitive functions, how they can reorganize in response to age-related reductions in brain volume. So the cellular loss that we experience doesn't have to mean that people become cognitively impaired. It doesn't mean that. Because in fact, the brain can reorganize itself to compensate for this loss, and in so doing, preserves performance, cognitive function. Now, in order to look at this structure-function relationship in living people, we have to resort to technology like this. This is an MRI scanner, magnetic resonance imaging scanner. It's non-invasive. We scan people in one of these all the time. It measures activity in the living brain. So when someone is carrying out a cognitive task, cognitive function or whatever, then this is what happens. You get these blobs that light up. You get these patterns of activation in the brain. You've probably seen pictures like this elsewhere. You also get a picture of the structure of the brain so that you can actually see where the changes are <laughs> if you do in longitudinal studies. And also you know what this, this particular person's brain looks like who's carrying out this particular pattern of activation. So how does functional compensation work then? Well, in many cognitive tasks, older adults who perform well on cognitive tasks produce bilateral activation. So in this, which is a memory study, young adults, act, the activation, so the activation in response to carrying out the task was just confined to this one side of the brain. And this was also the case with older adults who performed not so well on a cognitive task of memory. Okay? But older adults who were high performers, who performed well on the cognitive task, show bilateral activation, that is, activation 
in both hemispheres. And the argument is that this bilateral activity compensates for the declines in brain structure. And when it happens, when you get this bilateral activation, which you can see you don't always get in all older people, in all tasks, then this is associated with um, improved cognition. Now, functional compensation like this, where the brain can sort of reorganize itself um, in response <coughs> to changes that have taken place in the structure, <coughs> are typically seen in cognitive functions which generally decline with age, like memory and attention. But we also see it in cognitive functions that are preserved across the adult lifespan, such as language comprehension, and we argue that this reflects particularly successful reorganization or compensation, as we also call it. So it's a, it's a it's an so <coughs> reorganization is probably going on all the time, um, but sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it doesn't work. And we we're, we're trying to understand the limits because clearly, if reorganization was always successful, then everybody would reorganize and perform and cognition would be preserved. But it isn't like that. There are some cognitive functions that typically do decline. And what we need to understand, and what people are trying to understand, is why some decline and others don't. So why reorganization is not possible for everything, for all cognitive functions, but it does work for others. So since it seems particularly effective, then it's worth trying to understand the limits of this particular process. So I'm going to give you an, uh, an example then from my lab where we focus on um, primarily on language function in ageing, both language comprehension and the dreaded word finding difficulties. Um, in language comprehension, as I said, then performance is, performance is um, maintained across the, adult, across the lifespan. So we carried out, this is just an example of a study that we carried out where we were interested in looking at one of the key components of language, and that is syntax, so the grammar of the language, which is a, a key component of hum, a human language. And to do that, we had people just lie in the scanner and they were listening to sentences like this, just normal sentences, and sentences like this were a bit funny. So these are fully grammatical sentences. She was writing to use the college of a fish she opened last week. So it's meaningless, but fully grammatical. We also had other kinds of sentences, control conditions, but these are the two important ones. So what people were doing when they were in the scanner, because we needed to get performance data, we needed to know how these, or whether these people were actually processing language um, normally across the lifespan, we told them um, that there would be a word that they would hear and they press a button as soon as they hear it. That's all they had to do. And we tell them before each trial what the word was. So in this case it was tree and in this case it was fish. So we could get some performance measures. There are many performance measures that we obtained, but this is just a, a very simple one just to illustrate that there was no... So people are faster to press the button to the target word in normal sentences, as you might expect, than anomalous sentences. And there's no difference. Older people show this effect, just like younger people. And we had some more, more, some more sophisticated analyses than these, but this, this does the job. This, this kind of pattern where you, say, where you see no changes across age is typical for uh, language comprehension studies, which, are fairly, which use fairly naturalistic kinds of language. OK. And in terms of um, changes in functional activation then, so younger people show this pattern, and this is typical of a variety of studies looking at syntax. So they sh younger people then show this left hemisphere, what we call a network, because this region is connected to this region in terms of activation. So when this is gets activated, this gets activated. So this is forming a functional network and you get a little bit of activation here as well. And so this is the syntax, this is the, kind, the typical pattern, particularly this bit in the left hemisphere here, that happens when you're processing syntax. In older people, you can see that you get essentially a bilateral system. So you get this, 
you get more activation, which is also typical of older people. But you also see the same sort of uh, frontal, it's the frontal cortex here, and a bit of the temporal cortex here, um, in the right hemisphere for older people. <coughs> and this activation here is directly related to the loss of grey matter in this system here. Right? So grey matter losses in these regions lead to increased activation here in the context of preserved function. So this is an example then of a highly effective uh, system that reorganizes well okay, in response to <coughs> reduced tissue integrity in, in, in the original system. Now when we see patterns like this, where we get bilateral activation, where the activation spreads in older people compared to younger people, people have claimed that this suggests that what happens in aging is that the system becomes, the cognitive system becomes less specialized. And they also claim that this means that it's less efficient. So it may be in terms of the use of brain tissue, but it's efficient in the sense that it is preserving function. So in a way, since we've got lots of spare cells lying around, efficiency is maintaining the system. And your main, the, the brain is maintaining the cognitive system by reorganizing and using a wider, more distributed system um, as it ages than it does in young people. OK. So the points I've made then are that age-related changes in brain structure do not inevitably lead to poor cognition. The brain, under some circumstances, which we're trying to understand, we don't know very much about this. I mean, this is all relatively new and very exciting stuff. So the brain is resilient and compensates for these changes and so maintains cognition. But not all cognitive functions are preserved in this way. For example, we know, we, we, we know that word-finding problems are much more intractable um, and difficult to deal with, and they persist. Okay, so now that we've um, had a short journey through um, one example of how the brain remains flexible and adaptive um, with age, I'm now going to talk about what I've called external influences, which which change brain function. And I'm only going to focus on these two, exercise and cognitive training. Both very contra controversial, although I think that the, um, the story on exercise is quite compelling, and I think the story on cognitive training is not. I thought you might like to... Um, <laughs> such, a, such an intellectual audience. I thought you might like to... Um, <laughs> If only Oscar Wilde knew what we know now. <laughs> anyway, and Cicero was right. Okay. So exercise, it turns out, is a wonderful thing. So I'm going to go through some examples of the effect of exercise on cognition and then on brain function. So I'm going to start out with... The exa an example from cognition, I'm going to start on one of our best-loved problems, word-finding problems. Okay, word-finding problems undoubtedly increase with age. And in our lab and in many other labs, there are lots of attempts to try to capture the essential qualities of the process and the nature of the problems and try to understand them in order that perhaps they can be ameliorated. A word-finding problem is... Now, I should have, as soon as I put this up, I should have asked you to shout out the name because now you've all... OK. In my lab, nobody knew this. <laughs> and so, so... And I bet you... Um, you get this? <laughs> so, with this audience, you might have more trouble with the next one. Whoops. This one. 
oh, can't get hold of you then. <laughs> okay, so word finding problems then increase with age, as we can see. So this is the number of word finding problems, or we call them TOTs, tip of the tongues, right? And this is age along here, and you can see there's a just, you know, but there's a lot of variability still. And word finding problems decrease with exercise. So this is fairly new pilot data from a colleague, uh, Debbie Burke in the States. Uh, this is increasing TOTs, and this is the distance walked in miles. These are people who, you know, America, especially California, is filled with hiking clubs. Actually, they're walking clubs, right? They don't hike anywhere. But uh, <laughs> intrepid older people go out with their friends, and they regularly walk. It's a fantastic thing. And so it's not difficult to get these cohorts of people who are doing exercise regularly. Mostly, though, they're doing exercise with others. So they're in a social context, which is also undoubtedly helping them as well. But anyway, in this experiment, then, um, Debbie looked at the distance walk. So this is in terms of miles per week, so 0 to 15. And you can see the longer you walk, the fewer word-finding problems that you have. So I think if word-finding problems can be reduced with walking, get out there. <laughs> okay, so the effect of exercise now on the brain. Now, there's lots of evidence, I think. I mean, not all the evidence is completely watertight by any manner of means, but I think there's lots of evidence which suggests that cardiovascular fitness increases functional activation and improves cognition. So the two go hand in hand. So in this particular study then, um, what they found was that older adults who have better cardiovascular health, and this was measured by oxygen uptake, were faster on a very demanding group <laughs> task. Now I'm going to make you participants in a stroop task so that you understand, I mean, you, you haven't got, you know, you don't know what's involved unless you experience it. Now, it needs you all to be brave. You have to do what you're asked to do. Okay, so you have to say out loud the color of the text as quickly as possible. the hard part. <laughs> now, I want you to do exactly the same thing again, and what you've got to do is to say the name of the colour the text is written in, okay? Not the text itself. The name of the colour the text is written in. And you shout out. Now, if I was uh, measuring your reaction times, I'd be able to tell that you're a bit slow at the harder section. Right? So you get into it, but uh, you really have to stop reading, you know, reading the word in order to say the name of the colour. So what people think the Stroop is about then, it's about selective attention. You've got to focus on a particular aspect of the task. And in this case, uh, and what you've got to do is to inhibit a habitual response. So a habitual response, a, a response that, we're very, that we do very easily, is to read text. But to name a colour is not a habitual response. So we've got to inhibit the thing we really want to do, we naturally want to do. And it it's therefore slows us down to do the other tasks that we're given. Anyway, this is the way that people... Um, test these cognitive faculties. And so um, you can see how difficult it is. Okay, but older adults who have better cardiovascular health are better on this task, as you can see from this graph. Right, so here we've got speed on the task and oxygen uptake. So oxygen uptake is an index of cardiovascular health and as you have more oxygen uptake, 
your speed, you get faster. And what also happens is people with, uh, who have better cardiovascular health show increases in functional brain activity, and these increases are mostly in the frontal cortex. Cardiovascular fitness also reduces losses in brain volume. So remember I said that there's this um, typical loss in gray matter tissue as you age. Cardiovascular fitness may be able to, prevent, may be able to reduce that. <coughs> I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that or the reasons why this might happen in a minute. So in this study then, walking was assessed at baseline and this is, this is showing the amount of walking. So people in this, um, in this cohort of subjects then, this is America, which is why it's in blocks. Um, so they, they walked either um, zero to 12 blocks a week, 12 to 24, 25 to 70, 73 to 300 blocks a week. Now, 300, <coughs> this, this range is between six to nine miles a week. And you can see from this graph that it's only actually this group who walked six to nine miles a week who um, showed this effect, right, of greater gray matter volume, brain tissue, nine years later. Now that is impressive. Now these effects were mainly then in the prefrontal cortex, so remember the frontal cortex is here, and in the hippocampus, Right, if we go back to the earlier picture, you saw the hippocampus. And this region in particular is critical for memory, this for executive control, and both for learning. And the other point to note is that individuals with better cardiovascular fitness were less likely to develop dementia. Okay, so in this slide then, I'm showing you evidence that cardiovascular fitness improves brain volumes and cognition. So before we had brain volumes and now we've got brain volumes and, co and cognition. So now this is a related study, but instead of just um, looking or asking people how much exercise um, they participated in each week, this was an, um, an intervention program. So it was an aerobic exercise program for one year. So. The researchers then were interested in these two regions, the hippocampus on the left and the right, which were involved in learning and memory. And what you see here is hippocampal volumes, so plotted here. So this is the amount of hippocampal volume, so increasing. And this is at um, zero months, six months, and 12 months. And you can see for some reason, this exercise group started off a bit better than the stretching group, but nevertheless, you can see they really diverge, so that by the 12 months, there's a massive difference between, well, the scale is very generous, but anyway, that there's a big difference, statistically significant difference is what people would say, um, between the exercise group and the stretching group. So these people, the stretchers, were also participating in an exercise program, but it was just stretching and toning. It wasn't aerobic, not cardiovascular. So the active adults then, who were in the exercise program, showed increases in brain volume, and moreover, this was associated with increases in working memory. So this shows the amount of um, change from the beginning to the, to the end of the trial for a year later in, in uh, memory performance, and this shows the amount of increase in brain volume in the right of the campus, but it was exactly the same on the left. And you can see that there's a significant increase. So <coughs> as the, the volume of the hippocampus increases, so cognitive function improves. If your you're, you're, you're cardiovascularly healthy, Okay, now cardiovascular fitness. We don't really know how, what the mechanism is that enables this whole process to work. 
Cardiovascular fitness may prevent loss of tissue in the first place, or it might serve to restore tissue that's been lost. So we can't tell at the moment uh, which one of these it is. But, and maybe it's both under different circumstances. Um, anyway, neurogenesis, the idea, the creation of new neurons throughout life. So these are adult born neurons is what they're called. They don't occur at birth. They, 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 they come into being throughout life, throughout adulthood. And neuroscientists are very excited by recent findings in neurogenesis. Now, these, these new neurons right, are, have only been observed in a region of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus, right, involved in learning and memory. And most of the work has been done not on humans. It's proved to be very difficult to do this on humans. It's been, a lot of work has been done on rats. But what people are typically trying to do, the model is that people have tried to develop, scientists have tried to develop an understanding of different processes in the chain of inference that you can make between neurogenesis and some kind of neurogenesis marker that you can use on humans. Right? So there are all these complex processes that they've worked out on rats or other species, so that all that they needed to do on humans was this non-invasive final step, and they could infer back that neurogenesis had occurred. Now, this finding in humans, the fact that there were adult-born neurons, overturned the century-old dogma that no new cells were created after birth. And we now know that this is wrong. And I know that this is um, not my area of expertise by any manner of means, but I think it's a lovely finding. So I just thought that I'd share it with you. So little is known about neurogenesis in, human in humans because it's difficult to carry out the appropriate experiments. But one breakthrough study used a drug to detect brain cancer, and this drug, drug marked proliferating cells and had the fortuitous side effect of identifying newly born neurons, in green here, in the adult human. So this was one of the first occasions when they'd actually been seen in humans. So, neurogenesis and exercise. So that's why I'm talking about neurogenesis, because it's a possible account of the effect of exercise on increasing brain volumes. But it's not the only one, because as I said, remember, it could be the case that exercise actually stops the losses or reduces the losses in the first place. But there is some recent evidence for um, neurogenesis following exercise in humans. And this comes from a recent study in which um, participants took part in a three-month aerobic exercise program. And they found that exercise increased cardiac fitness. It increased cognitive performance, as you can see. So this is the exercise program here. And, oh, sorry, no, it isn't. It's, it's, this is the measurements of regional cerebral blood volume in the dentate nucleus. Remember this area where, where you see neurogenesis. And this relates to increased neurogenesis because of these inferential links that scientists have been able to establish on rats. That increased volume, regional cerebral blood volume, in a particular region is evidence for increased neurogenesis. So, then, so there is this study then that's put together neurogenesis with the possibility of a mechanism um, for it to be responsive or new cells to be born in response to exercise. So to summarize then this uh, section on exercise and aging, what do I have to say except um, this? Get out there. <laughs> so there's lots of evidence then that exercise improves not only physical but also brain health and cognition. And we don't understand the mechanisms. But even without understanding the process, the link between exercise and cognitive health is very strong. And so it seems to me that if one wanted to have, you know, an easy tip, a relatively easy tip, it's not easy for everybody, but a relatively easy tip for trying to keep your brain healthy, it would be to do some form of exercise 
that just raises your heart rate, that's cardiovascular. Cognitive training. Now, here we go. This is a very vexed issue, and I don't know whether I should actually say anything in public about this. I might be sued by the huge numbers of companies that spend a fortune on cognitive training programs. Anyway, um, as a scientist, then, there are various issues in cognitive training. Um, first of all, we need to know whether practice improves performance, just practice per se, improves performance on a particular task. Then there's a, what is it, $64,000 question or whatever. Does training on one task transfer to other cognitive functions? This is what you want, because if you just get better at doing one thing, right, well, that's all very nice, and one likes to become an expert in various things, but that's not what this game is about. This game is about transfer, and whether or not if you become competent or more competent in one cognitive function, this will generalize to other to other related functions or maybe unrelated functions, but there will be some transfer. The other question is, do the improvements last? Because after all, you know, if you sit there in front of a computer console and you're doing these um, computer games for weeks, months, or whatever, and then you know you get tested, and then they you see some benefits, <laughs> and then they don't last beyond a day or a week or a month. It's not really a practical use. And then the other question is, is it feasible? So is the amount of training that you have to do compatible and fits in with people's lives? My view, unlike the view of many people who really believe in these programs, is that the jury's out, okay, as we'll see in some of the evidence that I'll present to you now. So it's clear one thing is clear. It's clear that uh, practice helps to improve performance at all ages. And it also helps um, on cognitive to improve cogn on cognitive tasks which tend to decline with age. So I'm going to give you some examples then from working memory, which is essential to most everyday activity. So working memory then is when you have to hold in mind temporarily a number of different things in order to perform some kind of task, right? And it clearly, de de sorry, clearly declines with age. Now, once again, uh, so working memory is tested, uh, the, the most popular test for testing working memory in aging is what's called the NBAC task. So this is a version of that, which is a two-back task. And I want you to do this, and then I'll tell you about it. OK. So what you have to do then is you'll see a sequence of patterns. Try and identify when the current pattern matches the pattern from two slides ago. OK. And what you've got to do now is to shout out now on the slide, which then matches. <laughs> okay, one more one more trial. Good. Okay. So the thing about um, the end back then is, again, as you can see, it's a measure of working memory because you've got to hold information, in this case, spatial information, in your mind um, <coughs> while you're viewing the next slide. <coughs> and it's only a temporary thing, so it's a sort of temporary buffer, if you like. Anyway, um, as I say, the, the reason why I wanted you to do that is so that you would understand, when I show you the results, what kinds of things um, people have to do um, when they're being tested on working memory tests. Because the NBAC task is the one that's most common. So what you were doing was two back. You were looking for a match that was two slides back. It could be three, four, five, six, seven. It can increase in difficulty. People also make it more difficult by having you do two things at the same time. So you could be doing a spatial NBAC task like you were doing where you're looking at orientation and position. 
Um, and also you can be listening to a set of words. Uh, it's mind-boggling. Anyway, okay, so practice improves working memory in both younger and older adults. So this was a spatial and back task, which is just like the one that you uh, carried out. They practice for 45 days for 15 minutes a day, and you can see the training sessions along here. This shows practice effects for younger adults, and you can see that there's a steady but not staggering increase over time. But for older adults, who obviously started at a much lower baseline, there's a massive increase. And in fact, what this study showed was the harder the version of the MBAP task that you were using, the more gains the older people made. And the, the practice effects um, maintained for three months. Okay, so cognitive training then, as I said, I think is highly um, fraught with problems. But there are examples, a number of examples, um, in which you get successful transfer okay, from one task that you're trained on to another that you tested on. And this is an example of this. So again, the training is on working memory. And you can see this is a complex working memory task. It's a dual working memory task, a dual NBAC. And people were practiced um, for some time, I think, 25 minutes a day for a maximum of 19 days. And you can see this improvement. This is the, train, the number of training sessions. This is performance. And you can see that they're getting steadily better. But then they were tested on a fluid intelligence, on, abs on, a, on a test called the Ravens Progressive Matrices, which is this, which, test to, which tests fluid intelligence, which is the ability to do abstract reasoning. Now, what you have to do in this test, I don't know whether you can see it, is that you have to complete the pattern. So you have this example, this example, and then you have to complete this pattern with one of these. Anyway, this is the results that they found. So this is performance, and again, this is test session. So this is pre-training and post-training. Now, they both start off, the training group, and there's always a control group of some kind, both start off showing the same level of performance um, before the training session. And then those who participate in the training session, I can't remember whether the control group must have done something because they have to be engaged in something, but not the same training test. You can see that the training group show um, profound uh, increases, <coughs> improvements um, on the Raven's progressive matrices, whereas the control group doesn't, the control group who did, did no training. Okay, so this then is an example, and there are others like this, of successful transfer from a trained to an untrained task. But for every one of those, there's just as many um, experiments that don't show this effect. So there have been a number of experiments um, that use very large samples of subjects, and this is an example of one of them. So here, in this, there was 2,126 subjects. I don't know what they did to get these people, but anyway, I think it was part of a large, co a large um, cohort. Okay, there were three training groups. One was trained on memory tasks, a second group on reasoning, and a third group on speed. And this was the results of the in the testing period. And you can see that it's only on the tasks that they were trained on, that they were good at on test. There was no improvement on any of the other tests unless they were trained on them. So this one then showed no, train, no transfer effects. And perhaps the largest mega test of all was this one that was conducted on... Um, Bang Goes Your Theory, a BBC program, um, conducted, this is a BBC, yeah, BBC program, and this um, experiment was carried out in conjunction with Adrian Owen at the uh, Cambridge Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. So this was a web-based study, and subjects, so subjects logged on, and they did the training for six weeks, and they were trained on a variety of cognitive tests, and they recruited 
There were 11, over 11,000 people that participated. It does improve performance for older people, just like younger people, so that scotches the um, stereotype of ageing as a period of ageing, i.e. older age, as a period of time when you can't learn anything new or you can't learn anything better. This is obviously not true. But the jury is out, I would argue, on whether practice transfers to new tasks or new cognitive domains. It's obviously going to um, <coughs> depend on the relationship between the cognitive properties of a particular task that you're trained on and the cognitive properties of a task that you're tested on. And any kind of cognitive test involves many different cognitive components. And it's understanding the nature of those cognitive functions and those cognitive tests so that you can relate them appropriately to each other. And, you know, this is stuff that we've been, people have been working on for a long time, and it, it's, it's a very difficult problem. Okay. So to summarise, then, brain health is the key. Right? Not chronological age, but brain health. And brain health is not the same as chronological age. It's an important point, although maybe seems obvious, but it, it isn't unfortunately obvious to many people. And the brain is more resilient than we once thought. It can adapt across the lifespan to age-related neural changes by means of functional organization, by means of some externally induced changes. And in so doing, cognition can be maintained. So what does this mean for us? Well, it seems to me, I, I feel very um, passionately about this. All my friends get, you know, bored out of their skins by talking, by being, talking about, you know, the stereotypes of ageing and the fact that they undermine people psychologically and it's a waste of resources and all that kind of stuff. And I think that that's because it's clear that the science argues for a completely different view of ageing than we typically hear. Of course we get older, and look older, unfortunately. But chronological age isn't associated in a straightforward way, either with how we feel or what we can do. Many people are indistinguishable in many ways from how they were 20 years previously. We can't avoid ageing, of course, because we want to live. But, we, but our aim is to age as healthily as possible. And this means physical <coughs> and mental health. And the two are inextricably linked, as, I've, as we've seen in the studies I've discussed today. The research I've talked about today can change our perspective on ageing. Rather than old models of ageing in which we retire to an armchair and moulder, i.e. relax, there is clear evidence that the changes that were once thought to be an inevitable consequence of ageing are not inevitable, or not inevitable as early as we thought. Moreover, the evidence, there's evidence that the brain is adaptive and responsive to external and internal events. Exercise is not the only thing that um, affects neurogenesis, by the way. There are also proteins in the blood, so that's a sort of an example of an internal effect, that, uh, internal phenomenon that might affect um, something as potentially important as neurogenesis. So the fact that the brain is adaptive and responsive to external and external events can prompt each of us to take action ourselves by exercising and also by keeping our minds active and engaged. It seems that it's never too late to start, however old we are, and even for people who are already suffering the signs of dementia. It seems as though exercise can bring some improvements. But of course, any behavioral change also involves that we change our own attitudes towards aging. And this is very difficult in the current climate, which is generally negative about older people. However, it's important to resist. Believe the science. And if you don't, I'm afraid the consequences can be bad, which is what I'm going to tell you about now. So I'm just going to conclude with a couple of examples of the negative consequences of negative stereotypes of aging. They can have consequences for cognition and for physical health. Unfortunately, this is a really relevant issue because many older adults think they're failing. Up to half of people over 65 say they have subjective memory problems. And the more you believe this, the more you succumb to it. 
So this is an experiment which shows the effect of negative stereotypes on cognition. So here in this experiment, people were asked to generate a sentence from a list of words like this. This was called the positive set. This, word, this set included a word that was positive about aging, wise. Right, this was a negative set which contained negative words about aging. So after they um, encountered this positive set in which they generated a sentence from these words, they then had to memorize a list of words and then they did the same with the negative set and on it went. And this is percent correct recall, this is for young people and older people, and this is, let's take the positive, the effect. So when people had generated sentences from um, this positive set, there was no difference across the age range. But there was a big difference between younger and older adults when people had generated sentences including negatively, negative stereotypes of aging. In that case, older people were much poorer at recalling a list of words, a regular old memory test, right? Which didn't in itself have any negative words in it about aging. So they were worse on a memory test when they'd absorbed, if you like, these negative stereotypes than when they hadn't. So the absorption of, this, of these negative stereotypes then had affected their memory performance. And it gets worse. So, <laughs> so there are studies also which have shown the effect of neg negative stereotypes on health. In this study, people aged 18 to 48 were evaluated for their attitudes towards older people. Some time <coughs> afterwards, because they were all ages, 18 to 48, and then when they had, or if they had, a cardiovascular event, it was recorded, and other health and lifestyle factors were probable. <coughs> so what this tells you is the probability of a cardiac event increases the probability of having, sorry, if, if you, if you um, have absorbed negative stereotypes, if you have rated your attitude towards older people negatively when you were much younger. And this is responses, this is the proportion of uh, cardiovascular accidents if you had rated previously um, aging as more positive, if you feel positive about it. So increasing numbers of people with negative aging stereotypes at cardiovascular events over time. It's quite terrifying, really. So the thing is that we have to believe the science and we have to try to change our views of what we're like and what others are like. And this is what to aim for. <laughs> you can either be like this, have an active brain and an active body, or you can be like this grumpy person. I personally like this, and my own personal goal is this. <laughs> <laughs> a long way to go. Thank you very much.